Hello everyone, I'm your host Kenzie Homequest, here to present to you an episode of a series that will possibly never return, History Oh Joy. And today we will be discussing a certain subtopic of an interesting age within the United States' history. Some might call it the Industrial Age, or how we will be saying it as the Gilded Age. What might that subtopic exactly be? Art. Art, as we know, has been an expressive and diverse way of visually sharing certain events, creators' imaginations, or feelings and emotions. By the time the Civil War was over and the United States began to move on into advancing its industry, many painters, sculptors, and cartoonists began to create their own depictions of the Gilded Age. Some made visuals that represented the beginning of new hope and rebirth, that our country would gloriously shine in this new era. Others took it satirically or negatively, willing to reveal the dark reality of corruption that had taken place in order to make that shiny top of gold. So, for the first half of this episode, we will have two artists with us who are able to help us discuss this topic and provide their insights into the matter. Our first guest is a local painter named Linda Ferguson. Good to see you, Linda. Good to see you too. Thanks for inviting me. And our second guest is a refined arts instructor, Dr. Charlson. It's a pleasure to also have you with us. Glad to see the both of you as well. In this segment, I will ask both of you questions based on these two portraits painted here, and perhaps we could be able to analyze and see what kind of message these artists wish to tell us. Sounds good? All right. Yeah. All right. This first painting is an oil on canvas painting created by the American painter Thomas Morin, which he entitled Smelting Works at Denver. Now, anybody who would pass by to see this painting, they would simply see it as a factory that has taken over the colorful skies. But what would you think Thomas wanted to say about the Gilded Age through this painting? Well, for me, when I w when I looked at this painting, I like to look and see the colors that were used in the in this canvas. When you view the colors that are rimmed on the outside, you see more lighter colors that were used, lighter blues, greens, some yellows and whites depicted on the sky here and there. And when you sneak further into the darker gray colors, that were used for the factories and smog in here. Dark blues, grays, and even black for the structures of the buildings were where you can't see its shapes. Do you think he responded negative then about the industrial supremacy? If I were to squeeze in, I would say not exactly. This to me isn't an environmental message or some kind of negativity to the progress of technology. Thomas, I think, was just wanting to show Americans and their evolution towards efficient technology and faster production, which required more workers. Now, while people could depict this as a way of saying that because of techno technological expansion, we have needed to create space by depleting environments, but to be honest, that just means that they're not thinking of it correctly. Ah, I agree. This does not seem to me that this is was simply a work of art explaining the idea of industrial supremacy and how its progression has changed many factors of the Americans, politically, socially, and economically, and even environmentally. But it's probably viewed in a neutral state rather than positive or negative. It captures a moment in time. Okay, yeah. A lot of people that I've recently known seem to think that just because there were terrible factors into the Gilded Age, such as low wages for workers, child labor was involved, sanitation was still in a slow progress, and political corruption, means that we have to look at this and say, let's say, devastating. But really, we've had worse experiences in our history. We still had things like the Great Depression, which that would come into the 1930s, or even further back before the Gilded Age with the Trail of Tears, where Indians and multiple tribes died of starvation or disease. Now, this isn't to say that everything was fine in the Gilded Age. No, of course not. <laughs> We're not even in the second half of this podcast. But the idea is we shouldn't see only the negative that happened at the time, but include looking at the progress we have achieved in order to come this far. All right, let's move on to the next painting, which is another oil on canvas portrait created by American painter Mary Cassett. This one is called Afternoon Tea Party. What we see when first looking at this painting is two women sitting down having tea with one another, one wearing a bonnet and holding a teacup on her right hand, cigarette in her left, and the other woman has her hair in a bun holding an ashtray, supposedly for the bonnet woman and her cigarettes. So with this painting in mind, it has also been said that Mary was inspired by Mark Twain's philosophy of the Gilded Age, that it was a thin layer of gold that had suppressed the political and social problems of the late 19th century. With this, do either one of you believe that this could have also portrayed any satirical or negative messages? 
Well, the thing is about satire, it is that usually artists or cartoonists doing the satire like to add a sense of irony into their art. They like to poke or make fun of these ideas, usually to share their opinion or to get the audience to think. Here you don't really see anything that is making fun of. There's no one in the background looking at these women or any text or conversations at the bottom. This to me is just a simple idea of what it was like to be in the elite class of America. And also, you don't see any dark or dreary colors added in. You can see that Mary used a lot of brighter tones, such as red and yellow, rather than blue or black, like in Thomas's painting. And like w what the good doctor said, it was like a painting shown what the elite class was like for women at the time. The one in the bonnet is having a smoke, which you were considered to be rich if you were to have such an item back then, as a cigarette. Women back then were definitely depicted going for menial or low-class jobs, hence why so many would decide to marry wealthy, political, and social men. They were also said to be focused on different atmospheres, such as department stores, parks, and theaters, anywhere where they could find entertainment. Definitely. Well, I think we could squeeze in one more question about this then before we head to our break, which is, how do you both feel overall about the art that was made in this time? Do you think either positive or negative outweighed themselves, or were they at a certain level of even? Hmm. Well, to be honest with you, could tell that these American artists definitely took on a different perspective by the time the Gilded Age came around. As you said at the beginning, many artists did have a sense of a new coming of the age for America, almost like an American version of the Renaissance in 14 to 15 European. They thought that because of the mass explanation in its industry that it would promote a better hope or a better future for America. While it may have been a grueling process at points, how we are here now based on technology shows itself as a well in art. As for its negative approaches in art, you see how many that depicts that atmosphere were really only made in the late 19th century to 1900. These artists did like to show a bleaker reality of what it was like to live in this vast expansion of technology, which it isn't to say terrible, but these arts are all made based on perspective in the end. So for us overall, we say that it counteracts one another and that there really is no true right or wrong based on both sides. Hmm, I see. Well, unfortunately, as much as I enjoy both of you guys' thoughts on this topic, we're all out of time for today. Thank you very much on your insights of the Gilded Age. You two have been very engaging to talk to. Ah, of course. It's good to see you as well, Kenzie. Yes, we hope we could come back for on this podcast for another time. Hmm, I'm not so sure, considering this podcast will probably never come back, but we'll be right back, folks, for the second half, after this really quick commercial break. Please stay tuned. I'll be lonely if you leave. Feeling the heat like it's Waco, Texas? How about a refreshing ice cold Dr. Pepper? Straight out of the Gilded Age, created by Charles Alderton, a pharmacist working at the old corner drugstore. Taste that fruity goodness that drove people crazy at the 1904 World's Fair along with their first bite of hamburgers and Frankfurters served on buns. What could be better than that king of beverages, that old doc, an ice cold Dr. Pepper? All right, folks, welcome back to our delightful podcast, History O oh Joy, where we will now be transitioning to our second half of this episode. Here, we'll be talking about more of the satirical and bolder style of art, cartoons, or political cartoons, to be specific. Political cartoons from then and now has been a prominent way for artists to make fun or find comedic ways to criticize about political events that usually occur. Back then, people thought that these cartoons were usually sought to be never really thought of. But lately, when we look back onto these cartoons, we could definitely see that there was a lot of depth that would be put into these simple panels of ink and history. Now, by the time the Gilded Age came around, there was one particular man that would stand out the most and would be one of the most influential political cartoonists in his age, Thomas Nast. Thomas Nast was an American-German cartoonist who was specifically made famous for making his cartoons for such American events as the Civil War and for our topic, the Gilded Age. However, his most prominent works came from his satirizing of the corrupt politician William Boss Tweed. 
Once again, I will not be discussing this topic alone, for I have with me a local editorial cartoonist who could be able to help me with analyzing Nest cartoons. This is Jason Green. How are you doing, Jason? Doing well. It's nice of you to have me on your podcast for today. Of course. Now, I know you just got here, but time is limited for us, so I'll at least be having the chance to share with you one cartoon made by Thomas Nest. Sure, that's fine with me. All right, as mentioned, Nast always has made many cartoons that would go against Tweed and his methods when he would control Tammany Hall. To those who don't know, was the executive committee of New York City's Democratic Party organization. So, I definitely thought hard to find the proper cartoon that we will be able to analyze for this matter. Here we have a popular one entitled by Nast called The Brains, where it seems as though as if he doesn't have a brain, but instead he has his whole body with him, all but a money bag for a head. While it is obvious for the both of us who know about Tweed, Jason, why don't we tell the audience what this exactly means? Well, this quaint image definitely has some context written all over it. Because, see, the thing about Tweed was that he was considered greedy. So I can completely see why Nast would make such an easy swap of heads. It was written on websites such as Britannica that Tweed would make false vouchers, leases, padded bills. Why, he even frauded elections just to make sure he would stay where he was. Wow, you really seem to know quite a bit of Boss Tweeds. I've looked these things up when I was learning about cartoons. I see. Well... How do you feel specifically about Nast making these cartoons against Tweed? Do you think he had a point when it came to making them? I think he was fantastic when it came to satirizing and using the power of cartoons to exploit a corrupted politician within a politically issued age of America. That to me and to many other cartoonists in his time and our current time show that we, as people, can have the power to be able to show people who they truly are. We can have the ability to take a pen and paper and create something that can truly be meaningful for us to know. So for me, I definitely see a lot of meaning if I were to view a man with a money bag for his face, if can for sure mean something. Alrighty, cool. Well, I'm sorry, but we're all out of time for this segment, so I'll be having to end it off by saying thank you very much for joining with me, Jason. It was a pleasure gaining your insight on this cartoon. Of course, it was good to see you too. Thank you. And as for the rest of this audience, I'd like to say thank you for listening in and keeping company. I'll hopefully be seeing you never on History Oh Joy. Goodbye, everybody.